We're always telling your stories, and it's time someone tells ours. We're humans first, journalists second. We chose this career to give you a voice. Now we're voicing ours. It's true, journalism has much room for improvement, but not all hope is lost, and we want your trust back by humanizing one journalist at a time. We're sharing with you what we go through to bring you the news. The pain, the tears, the trauma, and the mental health struggles. It's painful, and sometimes we even work two jobs to make ends meet. But we all have something in common. The passion, the joy, and the love we feel for storytelling and holding the powerful accountable. That includes holding ourselves accountable. So here are stories from us. This is how we want to help improve the news industry. The Awakened Journalist is proud to present Media Healers by Emiliana Molina Fajar. Hi everyone, welcome back to The Awakened Journalist and our special project, Media Healers. We are now on to our third season of Media Healers, so welcome back and I'm so glad you guys are here joining us today. We'll be speaking with Cesar Flores. He was in the news industry for almost 15 years. He graduated from the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, where he began his career as an intern in McAllen, Texas. He worked his way up in the news industry and became a reporter and a weekend news anchor. And he also worked as a weather forecaster for local news in Washington, D.C., which is a market size seven, according to the Nielsen DMA rankings. He also worked at a local TV station in Austin, Texas, as a producer and a news reporter. But if you ask Cesar, uh, once he gets into his story, he's basically done it all. Uh, played every single role in the news industry so far. And while he was on broadcast journalism, Cesar struggled with his mental health, his physical health and emotional health. And he finally made the decision to quit news in June of 2020, right after uh, COVID started hitting us pretty hard in around March of 2020 here in the United States, um, which is around the same time frame where a lot of journalists began to, you know, question their work or what they were doing in the news industry. And a lot of them quit due to burnout or feeling overwhelmed, overworked, um, or their mental, physical and emotional health took a toll. So Cesar, thank you for agreeing to speak with us and welcome. Hi, Milena, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here with you right now. Awesome. Cesar, so let's start with um, what I always ask everyone. What made you decide to become a journalist in the first place? Well, like most of us, it was a passion, like little kids, you know, some of them play like being firefighter, doctors, while well, I was used to play like asking people questions with my with a microphone in school when I was little. So I was always wanted to inform the community, always wanted to be the voice that so many people in our Hispanic community, community doesn't have. So that was something that I thought I was gonna make a difference. And I did for many years. And yeah, that's the main reason I became a journalist. Awesome. What is one experience that you had throughout your 15 years of career as a broadcast journalist and forecaster, reporter and producer and news anchor, because you've done it all, uh, that has touched your heart and, and it's something you'll cherish and remember forever? You know what? There was one story that really hit my heart and, and I was happy that I was able to make a difference in this uh, person. It happened about a guy, a young guy that had cancer and he was terminal cancer. He was with this girl and had a little baby. So they would live in a little small trailer, super hot during the summer days. And, you know, they knew that death was going to come by pretty soon. So I did the story about like their love, their struggles and everything. And the, the only desire was to get married before he would pass away. So after my story aired, um, the local government was able to provide a, a, a wedding dress, a wedding cake, a venue for them to get married. And then after a few weeks, unfortunately, the young guy passed and 
in a way, I feel happy and sad because of the situation, because they had a little girl and, and they were struggling so much, but their love was really, really strong. Did, so he passed away after they got married? Or? Yes. Okay, wow. And because of the story that aired, he was able to, for them to get married, get a wedding dress and all that. And wow, the, and okay, so your story aired and they got all the funding that they needed so that they could get married and, and pay for all the expenses. Yes, yeah, because that was his last um, wish before passing away. Wow. That's something that I will always remember. How did that make you feel? Like I mentioned, like super sad and super and happy in the same way because I was able to, through my work, um, get him that last wish, you know? And yeah, I mean, you can change lives and help people through our job being a journalist, but also it takes a toll on us as well. Yeah, and I think um, every single journalist should always remember the power that we have uh, through storytelling and through putting stories like this one in writing or in TV, uh, how much of an impact we can make in, in people's lives. That's amazing. Uh, that's great service that you did for for those people. And I'm sure that they'll always remember that as well. Um, so thank you for that story. Cesar, um, so it's not always easy, obviously, to be a journalist. And you've had 15 years of experience of playing absolutely almost every single role you can imagine within the uh, TV and broadcast news industry. So so far what do you think um was one of the hardest challenges that you faced while you were in news and how did you go about it well you know that we always have a deadline either wherever you are five or ten six or eleven and you have to work extremely hard under extenuous circumstances and for the most part the industry has gone to the part that you have to work everything yourself, be your own camera person, your own assignments person, your own driver, uh, editor, a report, everything you do. So, you know, there was time that sometimes uh, the, the vehicles from the company were not in the best shape, but then you have to still drive kind of fast to be able to make it because I mean, the, the, if you don't make the deadline, they either kill, kill your story, they tell you that um, they can give you even a write-up or a verbal warning or something. And it's something that you don't want to, especially at the beginning of your career because you want uh, all the, that passion and, and, and continue and growing in the industry. So you risk your life so many times just because of that situation. Can you give me an example of one of those situations where you think you put your life in danger to meet a deadline or to do your job and to the best of your abilities? Well, actually, yes. Uh, it happened when I was uh, reporting. There was a big uh, crash that happened like uh, in another close by uh, city. So I went, recorded the video. Back in the day, it, we still didn't have, you know, the live view or the um, anything to send electronically. So I had to rush really fast and the vehicle of the company was like in super bad shape, bad tires, bad transmission, everything was falling down. And, and the news director back in the day, like hurry as much as you can because we cannot miss it. This is kind of the top story or big crash, people are hurt and stuff. So it was like me rushing, going to the cars and I was scared, but I was at the same time with all this adrenaline trying to make it on time. So thank God nothing happened. I got there on time and I edited the video real quick, as fast as I could. So I sent it in and um, so at the end, and this is what really gets me angry sometimes that I put my life at risk. I run like as hard as I can. And then the, um, the editor didn't air it because he forgot it. He put it in another file, this and that. So, you know, like the news is everything is by minutes, seconds and everything. So they couldn't air it anymore at that time. 
So I put my my life in risk for nothing in a way. Wow, I'm so sorry uh, to hear that. I'm I'm so sorry that that happened, and I can relate to how frustrating that experience was because even though nothing happened, um, just the fact that you are retelling this story, um, I can imagine how traumatizing it, it was for you and how stressful it was to be able to make it back to the newsroom uh, to try to meet that deadline and then have the story not air. And the, they um, say, okay, we'll air at, at night. I'm like, really? Just as simple as that? Why don't you tell me, like, uh, drive back safely, don't take a risk, just drive carefully or something? No, it's like, we need it, we need it. So, yeah. Yeah, so all, all that pressure um, sometimes is in vain. And, and we allow news directors or upper management to put that pressure on ourselves as well. And, and I know in my case, I often didn't know how to set clear boundaries of, I'm not gonna make it today, I'm not gonna meet a deadline, or I can't go to the story because I don't feel safe and there's not enough time uh, to get there. Um, so that's, that's really unfortunate. Um, when you were in McAllen, Texas, I know it's a smaller size market, so and from there you moved on to austin texas for a little bit from there you moved on to washington dc and then you moved back to austin texas um, to be closer to family so mm -hmm. you've jumped around markets a lot um but i know working in smaller markets can sometimes be more chaotic and more stressful just because of the lack of resources was that the case for you in McAllen, texas it was part of it in McAllen and Austin even more. Then I moved to DC and, and I was a main weather anchor from a lot of parts of the East Coast. So I didn't have that much of a challenge of dangerous situations of going out because, you know, I definitely think that uh, multimedia journalists, uh, journalists that go out in the streets by themselves are the ones that are, are really risking their lives uh, every day more than anybody else. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. Um, and when you worked as a multimedia journalist, do you have any experiences that you could remember aside from, for example, going in the vehicle, driving really fast? Was that also as a multimedia journalist at that point? Yeah. yeah. At that point, I was already a multimedia journalist, but also like here in Austin, several things happen. And unfortunately, like you don't have the support of management. I think everything comes from management, you know, and that's a uh, very important role because they shouldn't be bosses, they should be leaders. And most of them, they're not. They're just covering their backs with one another because they know upper management, corporate people, and, and they get along really well, like friends. But they don't fight for the people that are like, you know, in their newsrooms or anything. They just wanna like pretend that everything is beautiful and it's nice, but it's not really because the ones that are really suffering or the, the news people, the report especially. Yeah, I agree. Um, reporters, especially multimedia journalists, have a pretty rough time trying to get the job done to meet deadlines and, and make their stories into the newscast for sure. Um, Cesar, so I know that for you in, in many cases, you felt lack of support from upper management within newsrooms. Um, also the pressure obviously to meet deadlines and get things done, um, putting your life at risk in certain situations. And I know when we spoke over the phone um, before coordinating this interview, you mentioned you also had a situation with a news station where um, you felt like your story was somewhat compromised because of economic interests that the station had with a client. Can you speak to me a little bit about that situation? You know, when the pandemic started, everything got extremely difficult for everybody in the world. So we started, most of us reporting from home, getting the videos at home and, and researching editing and presenting everything from home. Then since they thought that we were home, just chilling, you know, 
then we'll put more work, videos, more calls, set up more interviews, and so many things that uh, I felt in a way discriminated about, you know, like just for being home, you know? And it was not just having fun, watching TV, having coffee. Yeah, there was times of a little bit of everything, but most of it, it was like, they put a lot more pressure on us. You know, the situation was already chaotic with something that we had never experienced in our life. So now with adding these more pressure, you have two packages, you have video, you have to call and make some other interviews for other shows and stuff like that. So that put a lot of pressure and mental pressure and, and emotional pressure or not on a lot of us. Um, one time in, on top of it all, they didn't give us you know, the right equipment to work during those difficult times. At the beginning, it was just like, extend your, your arm as, much, as long as you can and as far as you can to interview. We didn't have the sticks that you will put your mic. So you will live in at home, but also with the um, um, pressure and uncertainty that you might catch something and bring it to your family and, and stuff like that. One time um, I did a story about, you know, uh, grocery stores and uh, businesses elevating the, the prices of their products. So we got a lot of uh, viewers saying, oh, look at my ticket. They, they raised the price of these, the eggs and milk and stuff like that. So it was not just one person based on nothing. I know that we as journalists have to take in consideration both parts, uh, you know, the victim or the uh, people during the, the situation or something. But, uh, you know, we also have to work against time deadlines, like we have mentioned. And this time they sent me, it was not my, my idea, to this supermarket to record something. I couldn't get the people in the supermarket. They were not, not there, the, the right people that didn't want to give an interview. So I only had the victim. I communicated with the producer. Look, this is all I have. Me knowing that I need both sides. So I don't know what you want to do. I mean, uh, you know, there's been a lot of people. I, we can, but with such a pressure with time, you didn't have a time to also send all these emails to contact or get a response from, from the uh, supermarket uh, management or corporate, corporate. So they mentioned, yeah, we need it because we need to fill this time in the newscast. So just record it with your phone, with the lady, what she's saying, what, because this is our viewers are suffering and blah, blah, blah. So with the authorization of the producer and knowing what I had only that part of the information, I say, okay, it's your call. So I did it. So, so it happened. I continued working a couple more months or three more months. So one day I'm like, got a call from the news director. Oh, Cesar, uh, you're gonna get a call. Don't just uh, be calm because I mean, I try to just be fair and, and, and not let people just do with you what they want. Just because they think, they think you're inferior. They are the bosses, not the leaders. So I was like, what's going on? And I'm like, well, just listen to them, agree to any, to everything they say. I'm like, but why, well, what's going on? So I get a call with the general manager, the original news director, the news director in the, back in the day. No, say, so I know you work really hard, but you know, the situations have come out of your, the hands of control, this and that. A few months ago, they, why didn't they do something right away, you know, mm -hmm. to fix it or something? But what happened is like what they mentioned to me is that that business put out, put out their account from um, the station because of that story. And they were not gonna be able to continue working with them. So they were, were gonna lose a lot of money. So they, they, they were giving me uh, a warning, a, a write up. And I'm like, but why, why me? I'm, I'm not the only one. Um, responsible for this and I, it was never my intention to to take business away from the from the station uh, and it was uh, the producer's call it was 
everyone's. And it was not my idea to do this story. Yeah, but you know what? We lost a lot of money, so we're going to have to give you a write up. And next time you have to check both sides, this and that. And I'm like, but I know how to do my job. I've done it for so many years. It's not like I started yesterday. So it really hurt me. And that was what made me quit because being unfair, being uh, working with people that didn't care for our well being of the reporters, it was just economic reasons. And I understand that we have to work the, the, the business that uh, show their brands on, on the TV what pay us. So I understand all of that, but I mean, I really felt it very unfair. And I, and back in the day, I also had like a segment helping people and it was my segment. So I will go and like, I will tell people, speak up, speak up because our community, the Hispanic community, community is always shy with fear. They don't want to speak up because of the consequences that might be get deported, this and that. And I will try to convince them so much. But then at the same time, it was me. It was many of us that felt the same that we didn't have a voice for our, ourselves. So one time also, besides the, this story that I told you about the business and pandemic and prices, I was going to do a story about them, helping someone. And I was like really about to cry. And like, I felt really, really depressed, really depressed. Even like not wanting to live at that point. Because journalist was my passion. I did for so many years. It is now now that I'm out, it's like they kill my dream. I allow them to kill my dream. And it's not fair. But I mean, someone has to speak up because those management people need to be um, more receptive to what we feel. And it's not just business, and it's not just ratings, and it's not just like, oh, it looks nice, go here, go there, by yourself especially, which I, I hated just not having someone that will help each other, you know? It was just you running around like crazy sometimes with my tie like, like this and say, oh, what do you need to put your tie? Like, I barely had time to even put, connect the camera to the live view and, and, and write the story and edit it. It was like, it was crazy. And that's what I think that, that's why we former reporters, actual reporters need to speak up for those injustice that happens a lot of, in the newsroom. Yeah, um, first of all, I wanna, take the time to validate all those feelings that are coming up for you with the situation um, because your story is very powerful and and I want to make sure that those feelings are validated um, so that we can continue helping you heal and through your story we can continue helping other journalists heal that have been in similar situations and have not felt the adequate support from their newsrooms um or their superiors um i can't even begin to imagine how frustrating that situation felt for you um, especially taking into consideration um the fact that you expressed for example with the first uh, story and the grocery store pulling out their account from from the company um, because of the story that you aired at the end of the day it is our job as journalists to speak the truth and speak what's going on, whether it is going to have a negative or positive impact on clients for those media companies. Um, and I trust that in your story, even though you didn't get the other side, we always know what to do when we only have one side. We have to write that, you know, this person wasn't available for comment or we didn't receive comment or whatnot, but there's an explanation given to why we couldn't um, find the other side of the story. And that should in no way ever become a reprimand on the journalist mm -hmm. um, simply because of economic reasons. That is 
from my perspective and my point of view, unethical and economic interest should never influence the work that we do as journalists. So that speaks volumes of the company that you were in. And it's not even necessary to mention names of the company because um, the space is not to do public shaming, but rather to bring awareness and to create positive change in the news industry. But I wanna make it clear for you to validate your feelings and any journalist that finds themselves in this situation that it is unethical from the news industry and this should have never in any way reflected on your work and the job that you did as a journalist um so thank you for sharing that that's very courageous on your end because i know how scary it can be to speak up um and how afraid a lot of journalists are within the news industry to do the exact thing that you are doing right now. So from the bottom of my heart, I thank you because I've known you for almost six years or more. And, and I know how hard you've worked, how far, far you've come. And I know that we've suffered together and been in pain together in certain news stations. Um, so I just, I want to thank you because we were both very afraid to speak out at one point and we're here now doing it for ourselves and for other colleagues. So thank you. No, and definitely Emiliana, this is amazing that you, you're validating my courage, but yours is beyond what expectation because having this uh, platform that you're doing is giving the voice of the people that are supposed to give voice to the community. So that's even better and so amazing. Now I'm gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, okay. Um, I love that this is being so healing for the both of us. So I'm sure it's gonna be very healing for whoever listens to this, this podcast and this interview. Uh, whew. <laughs> okay, so let's, yeah, I'm just gonna like sit and take in this moment because, wow, um, just honestly from the bottom of my heart, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I wanna move on now then to ask you, um, you know, I know you've had all kinds of experiences in the in the industry good uh not so good challenging rewarding um and i i want to ask um so far what you take away from the field and from the industry and and what you learned in the past 15 years you know what uh, when i was a little kid um, I was or protected by my mom because I was diagnosed uh, with encephalitis in another situation that they told me, they told my mom parents that I was going to die. So they overprotect me after, you know, a miracle really happened in my life that wow. uh, my mom was, it had, uh, has a lot of faith in God. So she will always carry me on her arms, uh, praying to God every single night. And one day, uh, little by little, all the doctors checked on, my, on me. And, you know, it was like I never had any those heart illnesses. So because of that um, situation of my, what I went through, she over, overprotected me. So one thing that I can give this industry is that show me that I can accomplish so much, so many things. And it pushed me to different, a situation that I never thought that I was going to be able to, to, to do, to be on my own, to talk to governors, to, to do, uh, help people and stuff like that. So really helped me and gave me the courage to be strong enough and, and be able to, to continue my life and fight for what I think is right. I love that. I love that. And that's, a good mantra to live by, do what you think is right. Um, 
I also want to go into something very important that you said a few minutes ago and that I don't want to leave unaddressed, but that I know it could be very painful. So please feel like you're in a safe space to share as much as you feel comfortable sharing and let me know you know how much I can guide this interview into sharing that part of your story because I don't want to impose um, you answering certain questions. So if you feel uncomfortable, just please feel free to not answer and we can move on to a different topic. But I know over the phone, um, you mentioned briefly and, and you just said it now as well, that um, at one point being in the news industry, you really felt like you just didn't want to live anymore. And I, I'm wondering if you feel comfortable sharing part of that experience for you and how being in the industry um, took a toll on your mental, physical and emotional health and led you to a very dark place that I trust you are now uh, doing much better with and are at a better place to speak about it. I'll try help <laughs> because it's, it's difficult. But you know what? This is something that you dream of since you were a little kid, you went to school for, you work so many hours, you've not eaten well, like skips meals and stuff like that. You have given your life to this uh, industry, this profession, this career. And then to be, to know that because of lack of empathy of leaders, bosses, you don't have a say so. You can speak, you can talk, but they won't, wouldn't listen. They will tell you, maybe, yes, maybe no, in the near future, something is gonna happen, but you feel left alone. So like I was telling you, me having a segment of helping people and giving them voice so they wouldn't be uh you know uh living in the shadows or something i was living in that same situation and not a lot of people know that many times i thought about not wanting to leave because they see you're on tv your family is proud of you because you're on tv your relatives so you have to pretend that you're from you just pretend, you know, I see now a lot of my colleagues, what, which what I did a lot, and it was great at the moment, you know, taking pictures with the prompter and this and that, and it's just creating a facade or something that is not the real thing, because in the newsroom, you, see, you go through so many things, and you portray this happiness, and, and I can think that a lot of people are happy, and, and in a great environment, work environment, but it's not like that everywhere. So, yeah, yeah, I had to continue working, you know? I mean, I'm not a rich person. I had to pay for my bills, but also hurting my, my mental health, my everything. So it was difficult because nobody understands that. And that's unfortunate. Because I'm giving an advice, look for help. Look for someone, a professional, but we're not looking for any professionals ourselves. Thank God that I have my family and good people around me that have helped me and supported me. And that's why I'm still here, because of them, not because of the management that I work for. Well, I just want to tell you that, um, I mean, while this can be extremely overwhelming, I, I see you, I hear you, I understand you, I see your worth, I see your value, I see how much love and passion you put into your career, and although it's unfortunate that uh, we often don't have management or uh, superiors that guide us in this way. Um, I think COVID has definitely began to help make a shift in that. And if not, I, I trust that 
this is one of the many ways uh, that we are helping other journalists uh, feel more empowered to actually speak up sooner or seek help sooner before even coming to a point where they have to consider taking their own life because there's a way out um, and that should never be an, an option or an alternative. Um, you're not alone. And, and I'm so glad that you had a support system around you to help you through this very difficult situation. And let me add a little bit of something that does uh, quitting that job was, I think one of the hardest decisions I have ever made because that's the only thing I knew how to do for 15 years, being editing, reporting, weather, uh, floor manager, uh, producer, so many things. That's the only thing I knew for about work. So, you know, risking just living your, what you have known for most of your life. And- uh, You can pick her up if you want, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I okay. think moral support. <laughs> My animal support. <laughs> so cute. Luna. So cute. <laughs> Luna, I love her. And um, I have to get this. <laughs> so it's been it's been it's been difficult after leaving you know what I used to not know how to do for so many years because after that you try different things and you don't always find the right job the place that you feel comfortable because you know you you were mold in a way that. Uh, you belong to an newsroom, you know, I felt like fish in the water. Then. So I tried different things, met different people, people that wanted to take advantage of it, the community knowing me or being a little bit, you know, public figure, stuff like that. And it's been pretty rough. But I mean, the thing is like, even though I say it, and sometimes I, I fall again, I have to always uh, get up and continue. But yeah, it's, it hasn't been easy after taking that decision of leaving the news industry. Yeah, no, I can totally relate and understand where you're coming from. Um, Cesar, before we, we finish the interview, I wanna ask you, um, well, one, if you want to add anything else that maybe I haven't asked you, um, and if not, um, going into detail of something that you would like to help improve in the news industry that you think it really needs to happen as soon as possible. Well, definitely management. I think everything comes from management. They, the people from corporate or someone, they need to really take a look of how many people leave during uh, news directors time uh, in the station. I mean, uh, one colleague that also left because of kind of the same reason, because of a uh, regional news director that came from San Antonio, is like during uh, her time being a news director, more than 30 people have left. And upper management and corporate, they don't do anything because she's funny, she dances, she does this, she does that. And you know, and this person can be pretty harsh. So, my friend, my colleague, ex coworker, left because she couldn't handle being under her authority anymore. When she became the new, when the, this lady became the re regional news director for Austin as well. Wow, yeah, definitely turnover rate in newsrooms is extremely high, um, especially in cases where uh, news directors aren't exactly. Um, supportive um, or empathetic um, and don't value the work that we do within newsrooms. Um, and that can definitely take a toll in, yeah. in our health, for sure. And what I say to everyone, I mean, I know it's easy to say and just do this, do that and look for help, but at least you know that sometimes we just go to other markets by ourselves, we leave our family behind 
because our passion for this industry. Once you feel that you can no longer continue, just go back to your family, to your friends, uh, because that's the only thing real that you're gonna have because people see you on TV and they think, oh, it's a lot of money, a lot of great things and stuff. And for some of them are, but not for the people in the local uh, industry or newsrooms. So yeah, it is fun to get recognized, but also uh, it's not everything, you know? So don't stay there just because you want to be popular or, or well-known. Just uh, be happy with yourself and just do what you think is right for yourself. I agree. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we say goodbye? But I wish I can give you a hug because I miss you. <laughs> you are very fun and I cherish your friendship a lot. Thank you. I'll give you a virtual hug. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Cesar. This interview was so beyond amazing, so healing for me. Um, I hope that it was for you as well and for everyone that listens to it because your story is so valuable. And I am so glad that you're still here from the bottom of my heart. And I'm so glad that you had the strength to, to live. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity. I mean, I have never spoken like this before. Uh, it's not easy, but I really appreciate it. And I really hope to see you soon. You're welcome anytime here to Austin. And once again, thank you. And hope that everybody that is watching, listening, to this interview um, can also relate and don't stay quiet and especially do it for yourself and for your family. The yes. news or the camera, I mean, you, you don't need anymore. We have everything on, on our phone, the platforms and everything. So just do it there, <laughs> whatever you like. You know, you can still be a reporter and have your, like you're doing, you know, stories and interviews and stuff. Exactly, exactly. And please do speak up. Um, please do seek help, especially if you're struggling with your emotional, mental, or physical health. And know that you are not ever, ever, ever alone. And if you do feel like you are, you know, look us up on Instagram. I'm sure Cesar would love to get messages from you guys um, if you need advice. And as would I. I, I am here to help you guys in any way that I possibly can. And, and I would love to do that for you guys. Uh, which is hence one of the biggest reasons for this podcast. So thank you, Cesar. Thank you, Miriam, and God bless you. God bless you and God bless you all. Thank you. Journalists, this was for you, to help you heal, to help you understand your worth, and to help you know you're not alone. So share the love and subscribe to Spotify and YouTube and follow us on Instagram. The Awakened Journalist is proud to present Media Healers by Emiliana Molina Fajardo.